Imagine the following scene. You have rented a canoe or kayak. With a smile on her face, Janet Casey, owner of the livery, confidently provides you with a brief pre-trip talk. Yet she knows nothing about river dynamics or the potential dangers you might encounter on the trip. She operates the livery with her daughter, Dawn, who also knows nothing about river dynamics or the potential dangers you may encounter on the trip. This is a case that had she followed the common practices of her industry, when you have an accident and circle the wagons, it will greatly aid your defense. Normally, the average flow is a benign 250 CFS. However, this day the river was 900 CFS, and at the time this picture was taken, it was flowing at 750 CFS. The scene was shot by a film crew sent to the site after Melanie's entrapment. Indicating the power of the water, note the compression wave on the rear deck of the kayak. This kayaker came inches from becoming impaled on the strainer herself. The river is strewn with strainers. Strainers are potential killers. They are often found on the outside of the river where the current undercuts the river bank and the tree falls into the river. The water flows through the strainer, but you don't. The best strategy is to avoid them. If you have no other choice, switch to aggressive swimming and swim up as high as possible onto the strainer. Janet Casey did not know what a strainer was, nor did she know the dangers that they pose. Should she have known? On July 4th, 2000, Melanie and her boyfriend rented a kayak from Winding Rivers Canoe Rental. It was a hot weekend in Detroit, and like a lot of other people, she sought a fun-filled weekend to cool herself off from the summer heat. Due to recent rainfall, the Clinton River was running at over 900 CFS. Its normal flow during summer was 250 CFS. While paddling down the river, Melanie entered a bend in the river. The current forced her toward the outside of the bend and into a strainer. Seeing the strainer, she fell off her kayak and was swept into the strainer where she was pinned and drowned. Most outfitters use a gauge to determine when to cease operations. From this passage, Janet had no real way to determine the water level, nor did she have an effective decision paradigm to determine when the water was too high for operations. A year before, there was a drowning in the hydraulic behind Yates Dam. After the death, Janet didn't learn anything about whitewater boating. She didn't read anything about her industry. She wasn't involved with any boating associations. Nothing was done to know what were the common practices of her industry or to make substantive changes in her operations. Barrier analysis is the process of placing barriers between the source of an unwanted energy transfer and a potential target. The barriers are less than adequate, meaning that they are not 100% effective. In the Mord analysis, there are four types of barriers. These are barriers on the source of the energy transfer, barriers between the energy source and the target, barriers on the target, and barriers that separate by time or space. A worksheet is useful for identifying and prioritizing potential barriers. In this example, the source of the unwanted energy transfer is the strainer. The unwanted energy transfer results in an impalement on the strainer and drowning. The target are canoeists and kayakers. Barriers can be placed in the source of the unwanted energy transfer. The numerous strainers can be prioritized in terms of their potential danger and removed. The second element necessary for a strainer is moving water. A gauge can be installed and operations cease above a gauge height where the flow of the river was determined to be potentially dangerous. Next, barriers can be placed between the energy source and the target. Typical examples are guardrails or shields. No good examples come to mind. Third are barriers placed on the target. 
Examples include life jackets, which increase flotation and protect the target. Interpretive posters and pre-trip talk-up can warn and educate boaters what to do if they encounter a strainer. These are examples of strengthening the target. Fourth, barriers can separate the energy transfer by time or space. Succession of activities until the water level drops is an example of separation by time. When the water is high, a different stretch of the river or a different river could be run. This would be separation by space. All of these barriers would be useful in creating a safer operations. It does not preclude other sources, such as joining a professional organization or contacting other liveries and learning the common practices of what they do. Returning to the death of Melanie, was there a breach of duty? Take any one of the previous barrier recommendations. Do they represent the common practices of the industry? And does their absence constitute a breach of duty? The case was settled out of court. Although the claim was not for a lot of money, the plaintiff was satisfied with the outcome. And, not unexpectedly, Winding River's canoe rental went out of business the day after Melanie drowned. Metaphorically, Janet Casey was a small fish in a small pond. After she circled the wagon, she found out that what she thought she was doing right was not consistent with the common practices in her industry. My takeaway from this case is that it is important to know what your common practices are in your industry. Then you will be prepared if and when you circle the wagons.